it doesn't work anymore. Confusion, like, 2016. Yeah, how do you, There's an app for that. What literary techniques causes that story to like just go like, oh my gosh, why you know, I can I can tell you the exact you know issue of Wired that they were reading in 1980 whatever that caused the story to be written this way, mm -hmm. and you just kind of want to see if you can dodge that. Are you angry? Yes, yes perfect. Hello. Now we have our full. I'm sorry, I was downstairs for. Oh, that's really nice. Is it alright if I record this and put it on YouTube? Hello, nice to meet you. Andrea, are you, a are you okay if uh, this is recorded? Oh, of course. Okay. Yeah. Alright, well, um, since we're all here, I guess we should start. Uh, I'm, my name is in bold, which means I think I'm the moderator. And it's interesting that this talk is, I mean, this panel is titled, There's an app for that, and I'm the moderator because this is my phone. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but nevertheless, I'll do the best I can. So I think we should start with uh, just introductions and um, tell us a little bit about you know, what you do that would be relevant for this panel and then I'll uh, start with some questions and then open it up to the audience. So, so, yeah. well, I'm still out of breath from my Well, we can start oh, with this side. Start with this side. Start from the other side. All right, we'll start with Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Um, <laughs> I'm Tobias Bakel. I'm a Caribbean-born science fiction and fantasy writer. I'm known for uh, my Zeta Wealth series, which is sort of like far future Caribbean space opera, and more recently, uh, Arctic Rising and Hurricane Fever, which uh, deal with the effects of uh, climate change and some technological changes in the uh, uh, near near future. And uh, about uh, 60 or so short stories in various magazines and anthologies. Hey, so I'm Daniel Dugan. I'm the science track lead here at Confusion. Um, we are working on a few different chunks and apps and integration components that are, are leading in assistive technology um, with a group called Enable. Um, I have a, a, a long history of, of technical writing, of you know science writing, and I do make an effort to, to help inject reality into the work that, that should be based on that. Um, so that's going to be my role here. Uh, hi, my name is Andrea Phillips. I have a debut novel out called Revision about a wiki where your edits come true. But for my day job, I am a games writer and a game designer. And uh, so I, I, I get to go a, a lot across platforms and uh, across different modes of storytelling and, interac and interaction. Wow, I can't talk anymore. This is amazing. Um, and I am also a really fierce gamer, and I have played ridiculous amount of, amounts of Candy Crush. Um, and I actually, I've, I've come to feel that Candy Crush and, and such casual games are important to my ability to work. Oh, wow. Mm. Um, and I'm Kentaro Toyama. I'm an associate professor at the School of Information at the University of Michigan. Um, I'm also honored to be the science guest of honor for this event. <laughs> Um, and um, I have a book out called Geek Heresy, which I realize that this event could be interpreted as people who like neither science fiction nor fantasy, but um, it's, the subtitle of this book is uh, um, Rescuing Social Change from the Cult of Technology. Nice. We'll be talking about that later today at 3. Um, so let me start, since, so this again, panel again is called There's an App for That, with a question mark. Uh, let me start by asking all of you, we'll ask an easy question. So what is your favorite um, app or service that you use on your smartphone? And I'm guessing that all of you have smartphones. Yes, yes. Uh, well, I, I, you, you pulled out your phone and I love it. No, because um, one of the most important things for me is, is the sort of essence of mindfulness in terms of interacting with my apps and why I use them. This question of what purpose does this thing have on my phone and does it improve or detract from my life? How do I set it up? Um, I, uh, one of the consulting gigs I have is with an individual who feels compelled to turn on all the alerts and have them forwarded to his Apple Watch and phone. And it is fascinating to talk to him because he has trouble getting things done. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> when I when I forward him on a request that he needs to do for for this this company that that he's built and apparently loves, um, it can take either you know 20 minutes to get done or a month or two because he's continuously distracted. I'm ADD, and, and so I basically, when I adapted my phone, I'm, I'm really hyper aware of what can cause me to end up in distraction loops and what is not. Um, so my favorite app is actually um, Fitbit app, and the pairing with the, the Fitbit to my smartphone. 
Um, right now, I'm, uh, I'm recovering. I have a heart defect, and I've just been cleared to run and lift again. And so actually, the, the thing I'm using the most is uh, my heart monitoring. Um, this monitors my heart, so when I run, I know not to run too hard, and it will immediately tell me if I'm overdoing it. Um, and in combination with that, I have an EKG monitor that I can access on the back of my phone. Um, and so those right now are the two most important apps in my life. Um, so I have kind of two favorite apps. I, I really enjoy, there is a, a, a built-in Android program called Keep, um, where you can stuff anything, pictures, mm -hmm. etc., whatever. Um, and I, I think of it as sending emails to my future self, right? So today, I'm, I'm very similar to your client device, where I have, you know, a dozen alerts that pop up every morning <laughs> you know, of things I should have done, you know, over the day and, and didn't do. Um, additionally, I have an app that I'm developing called the... Um, Comomatic that generates parametric sockets um, from recipients' um, measurements. Mm -hmm. um, so that is my, my second favorite app, but that is also a more of a labor of love than functional product right now. Um, that is it. I, I actually I just looked to see because the iPhone will hopefully tell you your four most used apps. Mm -hmm. My number one most used app is Twitter, <laughs> which should be unsurprising to people who use Twitter. Mm -hmm. And then the, the second most frequent one is Neko Optime, which is probably just the most recent in a rotating roster of very small games that I use as a way of giving myself a little bit of a liminal space. Um, uh, can, I, can I talk here a little bit about, about casual games in there and sure. the world of my productivity? So writing can be really hard. Um, any, any kind of really intense mental exertion can be hard. And I thought for a long time that the thing that casual games did was distract me and take, take away productive time that I should have been spending doing more work. But then I, I actually blocked Candy Crush uh, uh, by way of blocking Facebook and Twitter and so on for a very long period on my laptop at one point. And what I realized was that time that I spend playing a dumb casual game is actually time that I would instead be kind of upset and freaked out and not, not quite sure where I was going next in, in a story and just kind of staring at the screen. So what, I, what I've discovered basically is that these tiny little games that everyone thinks are a waste of time are a way for me to give my brain something not taxing to do while it is using a different part to solve a problem that I'm not quite ready to face in a conscious way yet. And if I can't do that, I actually can't write anywhere nearly as quickly. It's, it's fascinating. I really, really want someone to do a study now to see if my experience is unique. Very interesting. Um, let me turn this question around and ask uh, each of you also, you know, what app have you either used or seen used that you think is evil? <laughs> and we'll start with Dave, Dan. Oh, there's a variety of them, right? So anything, um, and so you're, the essence of this problem is, you know, the, the social media apps, right? Facebook, uh, Twitter, um, is, is anything that turns the user into a product is, is the wrong kind of app for anyone out mm. there. Um, so when you are, you know, modifying yourself, and your connections and your relationships um, for the sake of, of brands out there, that's the wrong app, right? It, it's setting you up to, to, to be utilized. Terrific, thank you. I, I actually really hate a lot of health apps, a lot of fitness <laughs> apps, so like, I, I kind of really hate the way that yeah. Fitbit does things. Um, I mean, I say this as I've, I've had, you know, three Nike fuel bands, and I have a Misfit, I've never had a Fitbit, but I've, I've been through this, and I'm, I'm as guilty as anyone of, of subjecting myself to these metrics, but what I found is the way that they're coded is incredibly inhuman, and they assume infinite capacity to improve forever, and they're all automatically designed so that moving more is always better, and weighing less is always better, and there are many people in many situations in which that is really not true. Um, there's the sort of the story of, of I've done it, and, and probably very many people have, of having We Fit when when this board first came out, and you put your um, your you know four year old on top of the We Fit board to calibrate, and then it says, oh, you gained two pounds. Don't worry, you can do better next week. Mm -hmm. Like. 
no, my, my four-year-old really doesn't need to be getting a message that she needs to lose weight. Like, there's time for that later, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I think it's actually kind of harmful, this, this idea that you should be min-maxing your activity all the time instead of, uh, instead of kind of being just in your body and moving to whatever capacity you have. Sometimes efficiency is not actually a, a valuable goal. Well, I think that's an interesting mm -hmm. critique of you know data centered yeah. uh, decision making overall. Yeah, to what? Oh no, I, I would totally agree with you. I'm not doing this for efficiency. I'm using this so that I don't die on the treadmill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, 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 definitely. You know, there's, def there's there's a max rate that my heart can go up to that my cardiologist is like, don't go above that, mm -hmm. and uh, I can't do that by feeling this. You know, just. Mm -hmm being able to pair this up and, and have it right there in front of me mm -hmm. as I go for a run, or this actually will buzz if I go above, right? You know, so if yeah. I go out for a run, I can set what my target heart rate is, and it'll let me know, yeah, and I can, I can go run fantastic. safely. And then uh, with the EKG app, again, I'm not trying to get efficiency. I just, after a really hard run or something mm -hmm. like that, you know, if I'm feeling really odd to be able to sit there and just put my fingers on it and send the results out to cardiologists real quick and get them back and have them say, everything looks fine, you're copacetic, you just are overtired or you need to eat or whatever. These are not so much maximizing efficiency as for me as just basically trying to um, actually get healthy without dying because that's actually a, a did, actually did very say, real side effect of. Dare I say that is probably an edge use case. Yes. Comparatively yes. speaking, but a really important one. Right. As far as um, on the general, um, yeah, I mean, I am a quantified self person, um, but. I started out when it was me taking notes in a notebook, and so for me, I very much, like I said, I, I try to come at it from an attitude of mindfulness, which is that I use things to track, and if I, I'm not trying to make myself feel bad. So for me, data is interesting, I yeah. love charts, right? Yeah. So for example, um, let's just turn this back retro. Um, a number of uh, years ago, I wrote this really great article, an uh, interview with Jerry Seinfeld, where he talked about how when he was designing and trying to create jokes, he wanted to write one new joke a day. Mm -hmm. And so he had this giant calendar, and every day that he wrote a joke, he put an X in it, right? And so what he wanted was an unbroken chain of Xs. And I just thought that was a really magical idea. And I got this old-fashioned chart, and it pinned it up onto my wall, and I said, every day that I write, I'll put an X on the day. And that'll be a really cool way, because I want to see how many days I skip. Um, and I've always tracked my words when I write them, because they give me information like, when my golden hours are, mm -hmm. and when I know I'm not going to write well, so I can unfrustrate myself by writing during golden hours and not writing during <laughs> not golden hours, right? It works out very well for me. Because um, it turns out I can write like a thousand words an hour when I'm golden, and about 150 words an hour in my off golden, right? So it's like, if I track it, I can actually spot, like, if I spend these three hours writing, I'm in good shape. Um, and then, uh, but keeping the X's actually really stressed me out last year because necessarily there were a lot of days where I had to do freelance work and other things, and I'm a family man, so yeah. I missed a lot of days of writing due to unavoidable circumstances, and I was really upset about that, and it really kind of depressed me, and I stopped keeping the X's on the calendar, so and it was just basically like, this is demotivational, not motivational. Yeah. So this year I kind of flipped it, and um, since I'm trying to get healthy again, uh, now that my cardiologist will allow me to be mobile, um, it, uh, I, I track, a plus sign is a day that I've worked out, and an X is a day I've written. And so I'm just trying to get an unbroken chain of just one or the other mm -hmm. all throughout. So if I can just have X, an X or a plus every day, and if I'm having a great day, it's an asterisk. asterisk. And that has been like madly motivating. I don't know what, I mean, it just, it, just tinkering with that enough. And it's not an app, it's not anything other than just a crappy piece of calendar on my it wall. It would be a good app, though. It could be. I could make it that now. I think it's you know it's one of these things where it's not the <clears throat> tool itself, but uh, how you use it. Yes. Right. That yes. Makes there's, the there's health user. month in Tibetica and so on that do right. similar kinds do of they? things. It's 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 funny that you say that it was demotivating after a certain point. I, I went to Rome at one point with my Nike Fuel band, and I got something like six thousand or eight thousand Nike Fuel that day, mm -hmm. which is their their goofy made up metric. And then that was my personal best when I had spent eight hours walking around Rome. And that was never going to happen again in, right. in my life, basically. <laughs> sort of extraordinary circumstances. But that was my personal best, and that was the standard that Nike wanted to hold me to for From the rest on. of all eternity. Yeah. And that's, that's like, 
it's, it's, it's because data is stupid, right? It just you doesn't know, know to ignore really thin cases. And Remember say, that one day what? you ran away from a jaguar? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. You should do that again. And then demoralizing on the, on the other side of the scale, you know, I, I discovered that on the day when I'm at home and I play Dragon Age all day, I'm getting like 350 Nike fuel walking to the refrigerator and back. And, and like that was incredibly depressing. And yet at the same time, sometimes you need a day like that. Yeah. Like there's there's a place in your life where the achievement is not necessarily the right thing to maintain yourself as a, a whole functional person. So, so you say like, you know, the guidelines is, does this app make you feel better about yourself? Yeah. Does this app actually motivate you? Mm -hmm. um, are, are just good guidelines. Like so mindfulness about what apps, you're doing. Right? Huh? There's so many vegetables apps that you feel like you should use to be a virtuous uh, person. I've never heard of those before. Right? That's good. I like that. Broccoli <laughs> apps. Yeah. 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 yeah I'm, I'm reviewing Jim Pat, or which yeah. is now called Pat, which which is this um, demotivational motivational app. <laughs> so what, here's here, here's the demotivation. When you sign up to use it. You, you can have different things like, you know, eat a vegetable every day or walk 10,000 steps a day or work out every day. And if you miss a day, you pay 10 bucks. You set up like, oh, I'm going to do it's three. It's a device. Yeah. 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 But if you do it and you meet your, whatever your goal is, you set your own goals, um, you, uh, you get money. So everyone who loses money, it goes into a big pool. Oh, and then cool. everyone who's hit their goals gets it divided out between them. So it, it changes from week to week. Like the first week I signed up for it was January 1st. And of course I got jack squat because everyone's out there achieving their goals. Right. And then the second week for each little exercise I completed because my mindset was like, well, I'm going to the gym anyway. Um, my, you know, my cardiologist is like, go. So I'm going to the gym. I might as well get 50 cents a trip, right? Let's do this. Um, but what was interesting about it was I was t poking around because I'm kind of a nutrition nut. Um, and I, I think of those things as unhealthy because I, I was curious about the kid. There was one for calorie counting. Mm -hmm. and God, talk about metrics that make you insane. Right, right. right. Um, because a lot of the people who are doing it are not nutritionists. They're, mm -hmm. they're, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, there is such a thing as a basal metabolic rate. You have to eat a minimum number of calories to exist as a person who just sits there. Yeah. And these things encourage you to eat less than that by, uh, yeah. you know, counting it. And I actually went and looked to see if their app was responsible. And they actually had a, we won't give you your, we won't let you win a day if you have below your your uh, certain amount, amount of calories. That's, that's Which I actually thought was really yeah. responsible. Exactly. So let me ask um, a different question since we're at a uh, science fiction event, mm -hmm. which is, you know, what do you think is the next either evolution of the smartphone or next technological thing that we will all be carrying around on our person or wearing or embedded in us. Uh, Tobias, I want to start with Tobias on this one. Oh, he's right. already... He's already thinking about it. He's already on the edge, yeah. <laughs> so oh, you want me to start yeah, with an yeah, idea? Yeah, no, I was waiting for you to start with an idea. Right, I want I'll, to hear what you have to say. I will you throw it out there. I'll start and I've, I've I, I'm just seeking it out very very things down. Right, so there, <laughs> We haven't actually progressed um, in communication at all over the last 200 years, right? This is all an illusion. Invention right? of electricity. Yeah, no, yeah, this is all an illusion. Um, we have these, you know, single sort of friends. We have these, you know. These <laughs> nice cycle of reference. Yeah, you're very welcome. I got a few of them. Um, it's, it's all a. You don't exist in this interconnected world, right? You don't. You're not these electrons that beam around in in the interwebs, right? You're an actual person that only has set social needs that have been fundamentally met forever. There is no huge step coming outside of the you know singularity when we're all be when we actually become electrons is the next thing, and that is I don't know another two hundred years from now. That's my opinion. Give or take. With it, yes. All right, very good. <laughs> I'm actually I'm really excited about augmented reality, which is probably I think reasonably a 30 year time frame at this point. Um, so people are really excited about virtual reality. I think virtual reality is really stupid. It was stupid in the 80s. It's still stupid now um, because isolating someone from interacting with the environment they're actually in is not a, a particularly functional or scalable thing to do. Augmented reality, on the other hand, like as, as much as Google Glass was, was kind of a, a crummy product, um, the idea of creating a visual field that overlays information into the real world 
is going to change everything once the technology is built out and robust. Um, even, even on a, a simple personal interaction level, if I can look at you and know what your name is, and whether mm -hmm. I've met you before, and it can remind me, you know, with a little a little display over your head, like like in the, the Sims or whatever, it tells me, you know, when I met you and where, and what your pets' names are, and you know, any notes on whether I liked you or whether you were the jerk who stole my soda, <laughs> right? Um, that, that, that's it get to the point where why talk to anyone, right? Well, because, or because is this then, you still have to have the, then you still have to have the interaction. But I think I think this sort of age. To, to memory, this aid to the brain, is something that we're already doing. We're already offloading a lot of what we do and think to Google. I don't remember actors. I, I don't remember film names. I actually, I, I'm the terrible person that really doesn't remember who wrote a specific book. Um, because someone will, will tell me, I, I have that information. I don't need to store it here. I don't need to know my way around everywhere. I have this to do it. And so if we can have that information more rapidly, um, and it's sort of right in front of us, embedded in the real world, instructions on how to use the coffee maker, or how to fix your engine, or, you know, in the field, sort of sort of medical procedures. It's, it's an amazing thing that will be, I don't know, it'll be, I, I hope I live to see it, basically. I think you will. Yay! <laughs> um. I was thinking when you talked about no new invention, the tele you mentioned the telegraph, and, and you read those articles about uh, you know the, the fact that people telegraphing each other were using some of the same shorthand that we were using in the text. <laughs> uh, right. You know, so like it, it's immediately like uh, you know the, the form has changed because we're sending it wirelessly, but we're still telegraphing. You know, and, and it's just that fewer people did it back then. It's just more accessible now, right? Um, you know, I'm fascinated in. One of the things I'm really obsessed about right now is the idea of the city as technology. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, we, we, we don't regard um, um, the, the gathering in place networks of human beings as uh, technology. And I think the city is one of the original technological inventions that's kind of a, a was a radical hack. And I think the thing is that uh, because we don't regard it as a technology, our study of it and our utilization of it is horribly implemented because we <laughs> depend on it happening um, organically and evolutionary. Um, and traditionally planned cities and intentional cities have been huge failures due to uh, command central uh, management um, in totalitarian states and they have a, a very bad taste with them. Um, whereas our organic cities, and in fact the older the organic city the more effective it has been, particularly if your city is pre-car because they're built human scale. Right. Um, and there are a lot of lessons in technology that has been forgotten, and I'm really fascinated to see a revival of um, city planning as a uh, technology. Um, and um, you mentioned, you know, solving some human problems. Um, you know, I, I live in a very small, walkable town, and um, I've solved a tremendous number of problems that I was trying to solve through apps earlier in my life through becoming um, radically more locally social. Um, one through the, un, you know, unintentionally through the uh, having kids um, and becoming bonded to our local area by, through them. Um, but also then meeting more parents um, and other people in the community like me than I realized had existed, um, partially through things like Facebook and networks and things like that, some local networks, but mainly by just getting out there and hitting the ground uh, during a period where I withdrew from social media pretty much mm -hmm. um, and was forced to automatically, instead of getting on Twitter to, to sort of validate my daily social interactions, yeah. I started to force myself to go out and uh, be social um, and not wait for that one con or, or that one thing um, and just start building a network of people who could watch the movies I liked and, and read the books that I liked and, and had a similar sense of humor uh, who gather at my house many times a week mm -hmm. or we go up to the bar together. Um, that has been profoundly good for my, my mental health. It's, it's, it's interesting because I, I could use a thing like that, but I have no faith that there are people like me in my community. Uh, I didn't either. Yeah, yeah, no, I it, didn't it's, either. It's, it's funny because probably there are, I just haven't yeah. put out the right... No, because everyone else is hiding and hoping to find yeah. you too. What I found out was that as we built this network, that there's suddenly a lot of people who are just sort of like, I'm so friggin' grateful and excited about this mm -hmm. that that we, we that, that we've been able to do this and uh, 
not grateful. I mean, that makes it sound like I'm some mastermind that did something amazing. No, it's just the fact that like we've been able to find each other is so really cool because some of us just assumed there weren't other people that we could hang out with, that we were kind of like the lone person mm -hmm. like ourselves. And we're all different, but I mean, it's just there's enough there that it's really helped me. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Um, Daniel, since you brought a prop, you want to tell us a little bit about it? Oh, I brought this to show you. <laughs> but sure. <Yay. laughs> yeah. So. Um, I work with a group called Enable, um, we 3D print hands, right, and the, the end goal of the work I'm doing is um, distributed um, additive technology that is, that kind of drops out of an airplane into a, a region that can't serve, you know, children that have, you know, ambiotic band syndrome or missing hands and fingers, right, so one of the things um, that apps have to do um, is, is regionality. Um, is is fitting the need not for you know I don't know how many people are in the, the, the planet right now but we don't need a single serve app that that gives internet to you know billions